have been given the task of wrapping us up by talking about how to practice faith, not fear, the steps that you can do to reclaim our country. Uh, I, um, I, I loved what one of the um, Teen Eagles said, that if you can imagine the danger, Eagle Forum covers it. I like, that's going to be our new slogan, right? <laughs> what a great line. But, but, as I, but here's what I've thought about what you can do. Number one, be a leader. And I, uh, you know, my mother always said, leaders are not born, they're made. Leaders are not born, they're trained. Our purpose in Eagle Forum is to train you up so that you can have the confidence and the success to be a leader in your community. And if you think about what James Lindsay said about that interesting study that was done, which, which said that if you know, you have a group of uh, five people, and if four of them say the wrong answer, 37% of the time, the fifth person will say the wrong answer. But if you have a group of five people, and one of those four people says the right answer, the fifth person is 93% of the time, the fifth person will say the right answer. We just need one person to stand up and say the right answer. And that's what leadership is. And leadership can happen in very small ways. Leadership is not necessarily, Wes, getting up on, taking two steps and getting up on the podium. Leadership can be just what you do in your community. And I remember a couple of years ago, I, I wasn't wearing a mask in my store. And it was amazing how many times people would come in the store, see that I wasn't wearing a mask, and immediately take their mask off. That's leadership. All, just not having a face covering is leadership. Because if you do not speak up, nature abhors a vacuum, and you give the, you give the vacuum to the left to fill it, and they will fill it, which is why we need to speak up uh, and, and uh, push back. When we, um, we heard a little bit this, this morning about the authority of the medical, the scientific, the UN, the authorities, and how the authorities have our best interest at heart, and how the authorities are looking after us, and how the authorities are going to give us all the rules that we need to live by. Well, I'm old enough to remember a bumper sticker that everybody used to love to put on that said, question authority. Let's bring back that bumper sticker, but I have a little bit of, of uh, change on it. Question the authorities. Who put them in charge to, be, to run our lives? We must always question what we have going on because totalitarianism happens because of fear, and, and it happens through the guise of public safety. We're a little fearful. The authorities have our best interest at heart. And for your own good, we're going to help you and secure you. And there goes all your liberties. Once you allow the authorities to shut down our businesses, close our churches, uh, close our schools, never again do should we ever allow the authorities to rule our lives. Because first we have to question. And just remember this question that you give to them. Does it work? Is what you're proposing actually going to work? Could you show me the evidence that it has ever worked in the past? Um, and push back, because we have to question. The, um, yesterday we heard a lot of talk about um, screens and what to do with screen time and how screens have overtaken our lives. My number three point is talk face to face with people, eyeballs to eyeballs. An email is not enough. A text message is not enough. There is nothing like face to face communication. And what I find with face to face communication is that people are so grateful to talk. Three years of this shutdown and isolation 
because I still see traces of the shutdown and isolation today. I still see people uh, uh, fearful of, uh, of talking to other people. We are hungry for social communication. We so need social interaction. And when you look eyeball to eyeball with a person, you are, you're recognizing their humanity and their individuality. And what, what, we've, what the authorities want us to do is to cover us with all the same paint and not recognize that we are individuals. When you talk individually with someone, you, you find out who they are. You find out what's driving them, where they want to go, and how you can connect with people. And how, and even if it's the most rabid liberal, my guess is you can find a point of connection and open it up and bring them, at least on one issue, over to our side. Because that's only come through person-to-person -person dialogue. And that is what we need to... Um, that's what we need to get to the heart of. Um, totalitarians rule by painting us in groups of people that have where we hate another group or we don't like another group of people. The haves versus the have-nots. And that is, that's been the heart of communism from the beginning, is to put the haves, is to, is to make the have-nots feel that they should be angry and envious against the haves of whatever privilege it might be. Uh, and um, once you paint a group of people as the other, you have erased their humanity. And that is why individual contact, eyeball to eyeball, is still the single best way of communication. And I don't care how many apps you may have on your phone or how many ways to communicate to people, nothing beats that interpersonal communication. But what, the, what communism is, is, is that it promotes greed and envy, that, that you're mad that somebody else has something that you don't have. Remember, the color of your neighbor's grass has nothing to do with your happiness. Ignore it. T take them for who they are. My next suggestion is to teach civics. I, I, think, I think the shutdown happened because we don't understand our fundamental rights and liberties in the Constitution. We don't understand what we have. And if you don't know what you have, you don't know how to use it, and you can't put it into play. We know the schools aren't teaching civics. We have to. And we have to teach it to everybody. And I have a plan. And I hope you all get as excited about it as I am. It's this new little booklet. And it's called, Is Our Constitution in Jeopardy? And it is an answer and question game where on the um, uh, odd number pages, I give the answer. And then you flip the page to get the question on the even number page. Get it? Jeopardy? Uh, actually, I have to thank Chris for giving me the title. It's all, it was all her idea. It was brilliant. Well, so what do we have? We all are, uh, we've all at some point in our lives have gotten a pocket constitution from some good conservative organization, and it sits in the back of our, uh, the, the bottom of our satchel, and we never look at it because the print is too fine. Uh, and it's, this is, this is 120 questions about the creation of our, of our founding document, about what's in the document, the ratification, the Bill of Rights, uh, and the amendments to the Constitution. It goes in chronological order. And it is spoon-fed so that with each line, you, you can have a teaching opportunity of what is actually in our Constitution. And when I give the question on the uh, uh, even number page, below it has the exact uh, quote from the Constitution that can be read. And yes, Francis, I think this would be great for your teen eagles and any other homeschooling uh, organization out there, because you can do your little uh, session on, um, 
the history of the United States, and then you can play a game to test it, whether or not you actually got it and see what our fundamental rights and liberties are. Everybody needs to know what the Constitution says. And I, I hope with this book that we can uh, have it in a fun and dynamic and interactive environment that people will be yearning to play the game again, yearning to want to know what's in the Constitution. And, and yes, I do try to be funny in some of the ones because sometimes humor can make things much more memorable. My book is not political. It does not, it's not partisan. It doesn't take a stand. It's just the facts about what is in our Constitution, what is our government, and how does our government work. I think actually our current president needs it because he keeps talking about how we're a democracy. And everybody in this room knows we are not a democracy. Democracies fail. We are a republic. That's like the first line we have to teach about civics. What is actually is the form of our government. The next point is we must demand consumer choice. How dare the government tell us what car we can drive, what energy we use in our home, what light bulbs we put in our, in our um, uh, chandeliers, uh, what food we put on our plate. They have no business to know what we do or what choices we make. And they have no business using our taxpayer money to, to boost up one industry at the expense of another industry. As many of you in this room uh, know, I am uh, by... Um, by career, a cook. Cooks like gas stoves. Don't take away my gas stove. And <laughs> the heat is instant on, instant off. I always say it's not. It's not uh, in, in cooking. It's not so much how how hot, how long it takes you to get the uh, the stove hot. It's how long it takes you to turn the stove off to keep the milk from boiling over. That's when you, why you really need a gas stove is turning off. Uh, but I, I noticed that a very famous uh, uh, chef in opening a restaurant recently. Uh, and I think it might have been in California, demanded an exception to the new state law so that he could have a gas stove, even though none of the new builds in, in his community were, uh, were allowed to have a gas stove. Well, if, if famous chefs at, at famous restaurants can get gas stoves, then any of us should get the energy that we want. And I thought that Congressman Miller had a great point when she said, eat beef, not bugs. Anytime you read about any totalitarian government, and if you haven't, there are plenty of books written about the horrors of totalitarianism, which are not limited to communism, but they are all about power. The first thing they do is shut down consumer choice. There's only one kind of sausage available. There's only one kind of shoes available. You don't have any choice as a consumer because the government in their, in their the authorities, in their wise, goodness have, have determined the shoe that you should wear and the sausage that you should eat, and that's the only one available. No, we will have the energy and the choice that we want, and there's no reason that any official should determine what's best for us. So continue to demand consumer choice in all areas. I am, um, I, as, and it's been talked of, um, and I, I still think this is a, a tremendous threat that we have to continually talk about, is the weather hyperbole. I, I, I love listening to um, The Enemy, which is, um, comes with taxpayer dollars called National Public Radio. And they've taken to all their news stories, they have a tagline, whatever the news story is, they, they, it'll you know, be talking about, um, oh, the sun's going to shine tomorrow due to man-made climate change. You know, there's a threat of rain the next day, due to man-made climate change. Everything is due to man-made climate change. Well, this is weaponizing a manufactured crisis. And, and, and the effort to put us into um, energy that is inefficient and more expensive is simply to destroy 
us. It's to, it, 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 our money, um, the savings that we have become less valuable if energy costs more. And there is a desire to, to, have, to force us into expensive energy uh, that is not as efficient. And if energy costs more to produce, then that energy, then, then, then if energy costs more to produce than the energy that you get from it, then that energy is neither green nor sust sustainable. And I would argue that there are a lot of these so-called green energies are not actually green because they cost more to produce uh, than they actually give you in energy. Uh, and um, so, first of all, there are huge taxpayer subsidies for it. Second of all, what you're, uh, you may build the windmills or, or build the solar arrays, but they don't last forever. They have to be replaced after 20 years. They have to be, what happens to that equipment? I mean, does it just get buried someplace? Um, the farmland that has been transformed uh, to uh, do this kind of energy is then no longer uh, useful as farmland. And the idea that we would put a solar panel in Maine makes no economic sense. Maine does not have sunshine for solar panels. And if any of you have ever been to a wind farm, the worst thing about a wind farm is the noise. It has noise pollution like you would not believe. No one wants to live next to a windmill. Just ask the Kennedy family. They knocked down the, they wouldn't didn't allow the windmills near their property. A car powered by energy from coal, which has to be recharged for two hours every 200 miles, is not a car you want to use. Um, next, and, and James Lindsley talked a lot about this, real knowledge, um, a real education, is the transmittal of knowledge. It is not a piece of paper. A piece of paper is not real education. Real education is knowledge, and the knowledge that you have gained that you can take with you for a lifetime. Because once you have knowledge, no one can take it away from you. A piece of paper can be taken away from you. If you only go to school to get a certificate, and then that certificate gives you the ability to get a license for your livelihood. You do not have education. You have a piece of paper that can be removed and taken away from you if the authorities determine that you are not playing by the rules they want you to play by. Certificates are not education. We must always promote our schooling to be knowledge the transmittal of knowledge that can then be applied anywhere and doesn't rely on a licensing bureau. Vote early and often. <laughs> now, how do you vote often? Well, as Susie just said, yes, you vote in every election. That's voting often. You even vote for dog catcher and certainly school board. But the other way of voting often is be your own precinct captain. Not just you vote, you get everybody you know to vote. You form your own precinct and take your vote and multiply it many times over by not relying on the party to get out the vote, not relying on whoever it is your precinct committee woman to get out the vote, but you are your own precinct committeeman. That each person in this room has multiple groups of people, whether it's a, it's, a, it's a church club or a quilting club or a food club or a, or a high school friends or college friends. There are multiple groups of people you know. Be a precinct committeeman, get the knowledge out of how people should vote, and then make sure they do vote. That is how to vote often because your vote needs to be multiplied in every single election. Um, one of the great lines I heard yesterday, and I now don't even remember which speaker said it, was leftist language is loaded. That's a great phrase. 
And um, because we see how the language has been corrupted and words that we think we know what they say get changed over to other words. But I've always thought it was so important for us to reclaim language and use language more effectively to explain our principles. I think one of the best examples of that that has happened was uh, when decades ago, the, uh, the conservatives came up with the phrase pro-life because, and then they had to be countered with pro-choice. But you know, it, uh, who really wants to be against life? And so I have noticed in the, in, the, um, in the political debate now, the language has changed to reproductive rights. If you listen closely to what the Democrats are saying, they're saying that they are for reproductive rights. Well, there is no reproduction in reproductive rights. Reproductive rights does not mean having babies. Reproductive rights means abortion rights. And I think we have, to, we have to call them out on it and say, well, where is the reproduction in, what you're in, in, in the laws that you're trying to do? Uh, and the, um, but we can use language can, that can be very effective. I, I think um, there's no question, we had uh, one woman from Virginia talk about yesterday how she stood up for, um, uh, for getting pornography out of schools, and instead she was called the book banner, and certainly the idea of, of being a book banner, well, what a terrible thing, you know, we don't want to be a book banner. But we have to be proactive and say, I do want to ban porn books in, in elementary school. There's no question that porn books have no um, uh, purpose in elementary school. The other thing about the book, about talking about the books, is that these books are not books with words, they're books with pictures. And we have to, and when they say that, oh, look at this great piece of literature that they're trying to ban, open it up and there are no words in it. They've been redrawn. You know, if the, if the student can't read, then you have to use the pictures and imagery to tell what the plot of the book is. And there are a number of books that are on the so-called banned book list. But the editions they're talking about are graphic, and I do mean graphic novels. In other words, they put the graphic in it. Uh, they're explicit. And so we have to be very clear about the books that, that have no business being in schools are not really books. They're graphic picture books with explicit porno imageries. Now tell me you don't you 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 you're in favor of uh, of trying to give children that those kinds of books that have no business uh, in it. The um, the other uh, another thing that I I in talking about the language and slurs that come from the other side that we have to be proactive and in in pushing back is sexual experimentation. Um, the, the whole sex ed in the, in the schools, starting in kindergarten where they want to ask you, you know, what pronoun you want to use, is a pushing of sexual experimentation. And what is lost with that is fidelity. And I think this is a, a word that we need to bring back and use and, and, and because every human craves fidelity. No one craves experimentation. You crave the love of your life. You crave um, a making a connection with another person that is a lifetime commitment. And why aren't we teaching fidelity in schools? Why aren't we teaching the beauty that, lo that love is in school? And love is commitment. It is not experimentation. And um, it was, it's actually Professor Robbie George from Princeton who has said, uh, who came out this year and said, June is Fidelity Month, and let's celebrate Fidelity Month. Maybe Target might do a line of clothing for that. <laughs> I do think that real science is under attack by the leftists because they're trying to wrap themselves in science. 
Because after all, Fauci says, I am science and an attack on me is an attack on science. Such hubris. That is not real science. Real science is when you can reproduce the experiment, like gravity. But science is now politicized. And so we must demand the evidence. Every time they say, well, this is science. And what did I hear settled science was talked about earlier today? Well, you all, uh, you may re remember in the history books, you know, prior to 1492, it was settled science that the earth was flat. Majority of people uh, living in Europe thought that uh, that was settled science, that the earth was flat. We must always demand the evidence, always push back and say, we, we must see whether this is, whether you can reproduce the experiment and where's the evidence. Um, and it, it, it comes down to this. Conservatives see the world for what it is and the leftists want a utopia. Well, utopias, don't exist, they're figment. We know the real world, and the real world demands real science and not a politicized science. And the X and Y chromosomes are in every cell of the body, and they cannot be changed. And anyone who says that, sci that biology is fluid is a biology denier. And biology trumps ideology. Um, I, um, I, and over the last couple of years, with all of this business about um, uh, the, the, uh, the trans uh, nonsense, I've come to the conclusion that um, the leftists promoting this ideology are genuinely anti-woman. They genuinely want to erase women. And we need to call it on them. Because if they say a man putting on a dress is a woman, then they are denying us what a woman is. And um, you know, it's, it's, it, should, it's, it, it should be uh, rejected in every possible way. If, uh, and, and we should say, why are you so anti-woman? Why are you opposed to women? Why don't you let women be women? And why are you invading our privacy? We demand our space. Uh, and the, 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 another point that um, I think the left has gotten a little bit carried away on, and I'm hoping that maybe some of the saner ones will realize this, is our urban centers and our big cities, which have now been overrun by, um, by the criminal element. And they're uninhabitable. Uh, you can't go to a Walmart or a, what, no, a Walgreens in San Francisco because they've all pulled out. Uh, and who does that hurt when, when the stores can't exist? And more importantly, you have all these people who are living on the streets and that is unclean. Sanitation is civilization. If urination and defecation are allowed on public streets, it is not civilization. And we must clean up, we must demand that these cities clean up their streets because it is not inhabitable and it causes disease. Maybe they're trying to cause disease for the next pandemic so they can shut us all down, but it is, it must be stopped. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the, it's kind of a little grim to talk about how all the slurs that they call us, all the bad names, the, the use and perv uh, perverse use of language. Oh, and by the way, I did write a book on that, too, that I have out there called um, How to Speak Liberal, so you can have fun with some of that language. It's also available. Uh, but I want to I wanna come to number 10 of the 10 steps, which is something I learned from my mother and that is joy. And it's something that we all can do. And we've heard a lot of grim things this weekend, but to express and live in joy is contagious, and it's more contagious than COVID. It is easy to get bogged down by the attacks, but we have an opportunity 
we live in the greatest land ever. We, we, we should express this joy every day that we are able to live free and we are able to do what we want. And yes, there's some people who want to take it away from us, but we will win because we have the joy. And um, my, uh, my mother's favorite perfume was joy. So subsequently, I have always worn a little bit of joy because wearing that perfume always reminds me, live the joy, express the joy, and, the, and, and joy will overcome and be, because it is the truth. And we will, we shall overcome. I am so happy that you've all been here uh, with us this weekend, and I look forward to many more conferences with you in the future. Thank you very much for coming.